we will now explore the Reggio Emilia model and the philosophy behind it. There are two objectives. The first objective is to understand the philosophy of Reggio Emilia and to experience a Reggio Emilia project activity. As you may have seen, the Reggio Emilia schools are in the northern part of Italy called Reggio Emilia. And it started in a little town called Villasella in the northern region of Italy, known as Reggio Romana. Uh, and it was a post-World War II initiative to bring change in Italy. And it gave birth to parent-run schools that we now know as Reggio Emilia preschools. And at this time, um, parents and children collected stone and sand and timber to build the school. But as we know, Loris Malaguzzi uh, uh, became aware of what these parents and children were trying to do and uh, joined them to establish what is now a world-renowned model of early childhood education. When you look at a Reggio Emilia school environment, they are aesthetically and intellectually stimulating. And these spaces convey a respect for the interest, rights, needs, and capacities of those who use that space, the children and the adults. There is a provocative display of objects. These are called provocations, and these are meant to uh, inspire and uh, serve to educate uh, children's attention to design, detail, or difference. These provocations, these displays, contribute to a development of an alert and active response to the world. There are frequent, there are frequent display of collected, collective efforts, such as leaves that are collected on a walk outside, and it allows each child to identify his or her contribution to a project. In the Reggio Emilia philosophy, the child is seen as is seen as a protagonist. That means they they are the leader. They lead the learning. Their their ideas, their interests are what teachers observe. And children collaborate with each other, with with the teachers, with the environment, with the materials, and they are also a communicator. They are capable of communicating their ideas in a hundred ways. The teacher then acts as a partner in this collaboration and nurtures and guides the children to explore their interests and researches the materials that are necessary to uh, support that exploration. And in this way, teacher, student, the environment, and families are cooperating and partnering together. In this philosophy, in the Reggio philosophy, the environment is seen as the third teacher and is part of what inspires children to explore their curiosity and to in, in create projects, which we'll look at later. Parents are partners and documentation is seen as a form of communication. And the Reggio goal is to cultivate within the child a lifelong passion for learning and exploration. In the Reggio philosophy, they say that the curriculum emerges. There isn't a fixed curriculum. It's very flexible. There are some general goals that teachers might have for children, but a lot of what forms the curriculum emerges out of teachers' observations of what children are interested in in the ongoing provision. Uh, there's informal assessment, a lot of documentation. Teachers make choices about what to offer and how to sustain the children in their exploration and learning. That's part of the teacher's research. And then the curriculum that emerges in the process of each activity and project that is an extension of the children's interests. In the model, the teacher's role, as I said, is to look, to observe students' interests, which form the basis for their activities. And the teacher is the research. So a researcher is one who listens, observes, and documents. And so the teacher does a lot of this, and they do this for children as well. And the teachers are also committed to reflecting on their own teaching and learning in the process of supporting children. 
The teacher's role continues to be based on the interests of students and they work together to form a project and they work together to determine the materials they need and seek the community support if they need it. But the student's interest is always at the core and the teacher are the primary planners of this emergent curriculum and these units of studies. So students are not simply following their own interest and doing whatever they want to do. The do is formulated by the teacher. The teacher observes what they're interested in and then formulates some projects that they might uh, be interested in ex and exploring based on those observations. The child's role is to explore, to wonder, to have, to have curiosity, to use their 100 languages to explore alongside the teacher. So it's collaborative, again, rather than the child asking a question and the adult answering that question, the search is taken together to, to find out the answers, to explore the ideas. So the child shows their understanding and expresses their ideas and thoughts creatively. Each of these hundred languages is valued, whether it's drawing, sculpting, dance, movement, painting, pretend play, modeling, music. The emphasis is on hands-on discovery, and it, which allows the children to use all of their senses and all of their languages to learn in a playful environment. Recall that in the Reggio philosophy, the environment is the third teacher. Therefore, the classrooms, the buildings, the Reggio schools are all purpose-built. These Reggio uh, classes, these Reggio schools, use a lot of natural light, organic materials, and tend to be very open concept. They might be on more than one level, but it's very open. You can see what's going on at all time. This also uh, is surrounded by windows and light, so all, a lot of natural light coming in. So in this environment, which is the third teacher, you'll see a lot of plants and vines, natural light, as I said, wall-sized windows, courtyards, and doors into the outside. Uh, the classrooms are open into a center piazza, which is a very uh, culturally um, significant part of the um, environment for those who live in Italy. Kitchens are open to view. Indeed, children have access to the kitchens. They help set the table with glasses and plates and knives and forks, all natural materials, nothing plastic. Um, the entries will capture the attention of both children and adults through the use of mirrors. There are lots of uh, displays and photographs of children's work, and these, these displays uh, tend to be uh, exist over years. So they also um, provide a, a curation of, of, of children's work over many years. So it documents the life of the school and the life of all the children who've come through the school. The atelier is at the heart of every Reggio school. It is an art area workshop that is filled with materials that are organized by hue and texture, and it continues the use of all these natural materials as well. And it's used for recording in visual form what students and children learn as they engage in projects of their own choosing. But as I said before, throughout the school, the materials that children get to work with, to play with, to explore, are all natural materials. Uh, silks, scarves, fabric scraps, wooden beads, wooden blocks, stones, rocks, twigs, leaves, sand, shells, clay. Instead of plastic toys, they use reusables like cardboard tubes, popsicle sticks, cotton, and wool. They also have centers called remita, which do have some um, 
recycled materials, cut, uh, cutoffs, leftovers from industry. And so some of those might be glass or colored plastic as well. Um, so it's not that there's never any use of plastic, but if they do use it, it's uh, uh, clean recycled uh, materials in these from these recycling, they call them Remita centers. So this is the end of the part where we explore sort of the philosophy of Reggio. In the next section, we're going to talk about some Reggio projects, and then we're going to prepare you to um, investigate something that will end up being uh, ideas for projects when we return on Friday.